Today I thought I'd continue with a series I started, it appears like ages ago, before we went to Germany, my wife and I, insofar as the timeline is concerned. And the last sermon I gave on the issue had to do with the heavenly signs and the day of the Lord. But that was already, I believe, the second or the third in the series, so I'd like to briefly go back and summarize what we have discussed so far. We saw that in Matthew chapter 24, basically, Jesus Christ gives certain events, talks about certain events which have to take place prior to his return. And he talked about religious deception, he talked about wars, he talked about famine, he talked about disease epidemics, he mentioned a great tribulation, including a martyrdom of the saints, he talked about heavenly signs, and then he also talked about a time described in other places as God's great wrath. And in comparing what he said in Matthew and Mark and Luke with the book of Revelation, we find how it corresponds. We find that in the book of Revelation, John sees a book with seven seals, and when those seals are opened, we hear about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the first four seals, corresponding to false religion, to war, to famine, to pestilence. And then further seals are opened, the fifths, the sixths, and the seventh seals. And of course, they talk about, again, religious persecution ongoing, the martyrdom of the saints. They talk about cosmic disturbances. And they also talk about the time of God's wrath. We pointed out that the Great Tribulation actually is Satan's wrath. Satan's wrath against true Christians or spiritual Israelites and also physical Israelites, the modern houses of Israel and Judah. And other passages told us that a military political leader in Europe called the beast, in the book of Revelation, will invade the Middle East, will conquer Jerusalem, and his forces will at the same time successfully attack the United States of America and Great Britain, apparently using nuclear weapons, because we read that all the big cities in the United States and the UK will be destroyed or will be laid waste in war. All of this will happen during the time Christ talks about and identifies as the Great Tribulation. So the beast will launch an attack both on spiritual Israel and approximately at the same time on the physical nations of Israel and Judah. These events will be followed by cosmic disturbances which in fact then and in turn will be followed by the day of the Lord or the seventh seal. And in the last sermon we have already started talking about the seventh seal consisting of seven trumpets. Now that's important to understand. The seventh seal consists of seven trumpets. And we refer to a few trumpets already. We saw that the first trumpet, when it is being blown, a firestorm apparently is destroying one-third of the trees and all the grass. One-third of the trees. When the second trumpet is blown, it appears like a huge burning meteorite will fall into the sea and it will destroy one-third of all sea creatures and one-third of all ocean ships. When the third trumpet is being blown, apparently another huge fiery comet or asteroid will be destroying or poisoning one-third of all the sweet drinking water. The first trumpet is blown and it brings further cosmic disturbances blocking one-third of the light of the sun, the moon and the stars. All of this is described in Revelation chapter 8. So remember, when these trumpets are blown, they will be affecting one-third of certain things. Then we talked about the fifth trumpet, which is also called the first woe. And that's referred to and described in Revelation chapter 9. It describes the final resurrection of the Roman Empire, which is coming out of the bottomless pit 
It talks about an end-time European power block. And this is describing a war which is going to take place between Europe and Asian nations, such as Russia, China, Japan, other Asian countries, after rumors from those areas will have disturbed the beast, who, by the way, is also referred to as the King of the North, who is also referred to as the King of Assyria. So that's the fifth trumpet, an attack of Europe against Asian countries. And then we talked already about the sixth trumpet, which is also referred to as the second bow. And there it is described a retaliation, a retaliatory attack of the Asian nations against Europe. We read about an army of 200 million soldiers from the east, from the east, out there to kill a third of mankind. What we are being told here is that the tormented Asian nations, who by the way were not killed, interestingly enough, by the beast, for whatever reason the beast will attack them but only will cause torment on them for five months. But when the Asian nations respond, they will respond with a counter-attack, but their actions will be ruthless and merciless. And they undoubtedly will use nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction, and they will kill one-third of mankind. These times are coming. If we watch the news, we see how it's being prepared how Asian nations become more and more nuclear powers, how they are coming together, how Europe is coming together. Sometimes it may think or it may seem that they don't come together that quickly, but they will. They will, and the Bible very clearly says that they will. So these were the six trumpets we have already discussed last time. Today then I want to talk about the seventh trumpet, or the third woe. The seventh trumpet. Now it's important to understand this. The seventh trumpet consists of seven last plagues. So we mustn't confuse this now. So we're talking about the seventh seal consisting of seven trumpets. And the seventh trumpet consists of the seven last plagues. It is those seven last plagues which with, with which God's wrath is concluded. That's important to understand too. The day of the Lord, God's wrath, will be ending with the seven last plagues. Now let's talk about these seven last plagues. First of all, let's turn to Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 1, because here they are introduced. Revelation 15 and verse 1. It says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels, having the seven last plagues. For in them the wrath of God is complete. So, Keep in mind, there can only be seven last plagues, and then the wrath of God is complete. I'm emphasizing this for a purpose, so let's keep it in mind. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 1. Revelation 16 and verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. And now notice verse 2. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Three things we want to talk about right now. The beast, the mark of the beast, and his image. Now we have already talked about the fact that the beast can refer to the final leader of the final revival 
of the ancient Roman Empire. But the word beast in the book of Revelation can also refer to the system as a whole. Remember when John saw the beast in Revelation 13 coming out of the sea, the seven heads and ten horns, it's talking about the Roman Empire and how it's being revived ten times. So the word beast can refer to the leader of the system and it can refer to the system. The same is true with the image. You see, it was the image of the first beast, apparently an image to the first system. What we find here is that in Europe there will be a final revival of the ancient Roman Empire. But it will be a combination between church and state. As we had many of these revivals in ancient times, you had the Holy Roman Empire, a combination, collaboration between church and state under, let's say, Charlemagne, Otto the Great, Charles V. You had even the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. And so what we find here is that the religious power over which the false prophet will preside will have created an image to the first beast. In other words, the religious system will have been structured and patterned after the political military system. It will be kind of an image, a mirror. The religious system, which is also identified in Revelation chapter 17 with a woman riding the beast, will have a part in that military system. It shows how they both supplement each other. You see, when it says the woman rides the beast, that can be understood in two different ways. It can be understood that the woman actually directs the beast. But in the Greek, actually, it says, sits on the beast. And sitting on the beast can also mean that the beast actually is doing the running and the woman is just sitting on it. And in history, that has happened many times. There was always this conflict between church and state. The one always wanted to be over the other. And remember when the Pope came to try to crown Napoleon. Napoleon took the crown from the Pope and placed it on his own head. And as we will see, hopefully today, this fight between those two powers will continue, as Revelation clearly says, but they will still be working together to an extent, collaborating with each, with each other, and especially when they find a common enemy. So when it comes to the mark of the beast, the mark, of course, is a particular sign of identification. It will be imposed and it will be accepted by all those who are going to be deceived by Satan to worship the political and religious leaders of that European power bloc and the entire system. In Nazi Germany, people literally worshipped Adolf Hitler. In Nazi Italy, people literally worshipped Mussolini, even calling him a god, referring back to the ancient times of the Roman Caesars. And of course in many other countries around the world, political and religious leaders have been worshipped. So it's nothing unusual in that sense that in the end time, when this final resurrection is going to take place, people will actually worship both the beast as well as that false prophet. So the mark of the beast is tantamount to a political and religious philosophy, which is detrimental to the worship of God. It includes the, notice this, mandatory and legally enforced celebration of pagan holidays, such as Sunday, Christmas, and Easter, and the rejection of God's weekly and annual holy days, including the weekly Sabbath, which is Saturday, Friday to Saturday, and for instance the Feast of Tabernacles, and especially in Europe, having just come back from Germany, it's amazing, you know, during Easter time, everything is closed. Good Friday, it's closed. Easter Sunday, it's closed. Easter Monday, it's closed. You can't even go shopping anywhere. You can't. It's all closed. 
But of course, what people do is, oh, they work and they go shopping on Saturday. It's the only day the stores are open. You see how it's all upside down? How people are keeping those pagan holidays and violating God's holy days? It's mandatory that those stores are closed. It's legally enforced that they are closed. It's legally enforced that they can work. Even today, you can work. Don't you dare trying to work on Easter Sunday, for instance. Can't do it. You see, the mark of the beast, in a nutshell then, talks about human and ungodly ideas, such as supporting, embracing a religion which preaches a false Jesus, which preaches a false gospel, which has all the false wrong concepts. If we go on with the second of the seven last plagues, in Revelation chapter 16, verse 3, the story continues. It says, And the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Now, remember what we have discussed a few minutes ago. Originally, when the second trumpet was blown, one-third of the sea creatures died. In other words, the animals in the ocean we are talking about. Not just one particular little lake there or the Mediterranean Sea, we are talking about oceans worldwide, all of them. At that time, one-third of all sea creatures in the oceans will die. Now we read, all of them will. No animal in our oceans will survive. If you want to believe what the Bible says. Every animal in the oceans will die. And then notice the next, the third of the seven last plagues in Revelation chapter 16, verses 4 to 7. Revelation 16, verse 4. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just to do. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Now again, let's go back to the third trumpet we talked about. At that time, one-third of all the sweet drinking water was poisoned, causing the death at that time of one-third of the animals living in sweet water. Now we are told, at the time of the third plague of the seventh trumpet, that all the sweet water in the rivers and springs will become blood, strongly indicating then that they will cause the death of all sweet water animals. And that then in turn means that no animal living in our rivers and springs will survive. All animals in the oceans will die. All animals in our rivers and springs will die. Let's notice the force of the seven last plagues in Revelation chapter 16 verses 8 and 9. Revelation 16 verse 8 then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. You see, here we get a clue as to why God is allowing these things to happen. By that time, men will have reached a point of such perversion such degradation that it reminds us, frankly, of the conditions just prior to the flood. And so God is trying to wake them up. He's giving them a witness. He is bringing these trials upon them in the hope that some will wake up. Now, some will, as we will see in a moment, but at that point, they will not. In fact, they will begin to blaspheme God because the plague is so severe. Then when we go to the fifth of the seven last plagues, let's read it in Revelation chapter 16, verses 10 and 11. 
Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness. And they ignored their tongues because of the pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and didn't repent of their deeds. So the deeds obviously are the ones which are very bad, and of course, not just the deeds, the thoughts as well. So they again did not repent. They will blaspheme God. Remember now, we are talking about darkness falling upon the headquarters of the beast, the throne of the beast. Again, we'll talk about that in a moment, what that actually means and doesn't mean. I was reading an article in Germany while I was over there in a magazine, just speculating a little bit what will happen to Germany if there would be no power for, let's say, three or four days. Now, this has never ever happened. There were times where there was no power in certain cities. But this article was very interesting, talked about, okay, let's say there's no power for a couple days, three or four days. Now, the darkness could refer to the nighttime portion. Of course, you know, if you don't have power, that doesn't mean that you don't have any darkness, that you have any darkness during, during the day. So obviously more is involved here than just no power, but I still felt very uh, convinced by what they talked about if there's no power, because they said everything will break apart. No, the medical system wouldn't work. People couldn't get to hospitals. You couldn't go to banks. I mean, everything is just absolutely chaotic. That would just be in case there's no power for several days. How much worse it's going to be when this particular plague will strike Germany, Europe, which it will. Now let's talk about the six of the seven last plagues in Revelation 16, beginning in verse 12. Revelation 16 and verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east, notice this, might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, Satan the devil, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For well, they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth. See, all three of them do. See, in other words, obviously we have dragon, Satan the devil, we have the beast. He is demonically inspired, apparently possessed. And out of his mouth come out another demon, apparently. And then you have the false prophet. And he is demonically possessed. But they all go out performing signs. They go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, verse 15, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Verse 16, and they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. I will talk about that in a moment, but you never read anything about a battle of Armageddon. Most people talk about the battle of Armageddon. The Bible doesn't say anything about the battle of Armageddon. It talks about the battle of the great day of God Almighty, but that's not going to take place at Armageddon. What we read here is that they are being gathered, or gathered together at that place called Armageddon. We don't read that a battle will take place there, because it won't. But let's talk about the kings of the east a little bit. We have heard about them already when there was this war going on between Europe attacking the Asians, the Asian armies, and then the kings of the east counter-attacking Europe. But at that time, we don't read anything about the river Euphrates being dried up. What we read in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 14, let's go back to this a moment. At that time when this first battle is taking place, Revelation 9 and verse 14, we read also something about the river Euphrates, but not that it was dried up. We read that it was said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, so this is talking about the sixth trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So at that time, those angels who were bound there, apparently preventing that the kings of the east could cross the Euphrates in, in one way or another, they were released, making possible this war. But we don't read that at that time the river was 
dried up. But I'd like to also focus a bit more on the time of the Sixth Trumpet, when the kings from the East will attack European and non-European countries, including the Middle East. Now, why am I saying that? Well, first remember, they will be responsible for the death of one-third of mankind. Also remember that at that time, apparently, the beast and the false prophet will, at least at times, reside in the Middle East, reside in Jerusalem. Notice this in Daniel chapter 11, for example, where the beast is again introduced to us, but there he is called the king of the north. He is that final leader of the European revival in Daniel 11 and verse 45. First it says in verse 44, News from the east and the north shall trouble him, and therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. Verse 45, and he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. In other words, he will plant the tents of his palace in Jerusalem. We also read about the false prophet being in Jerusalem. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, now there, there he is referred to as a man of sin. Now some say, oh, this talks about the beast, this talks about the Antichrist. No, it doesn't. It talks about the false prophet. He also will be in the city of Jerusalem, living there. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. I believe this is a very important scripture for us today, especially for us today. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, Let no one deceive you by any means, regardless who says it, regardless where it comes from, regardless what convincing human speculatory arguments are being used. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come, unless the falling away comes first, the apostasy, that's what falling away means, falling away from the truth. So the people must have had the truth. Those who are falling away must have had the truth, are falling away from the truth. That has to come first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Now I don't think the son of perdition, the son of man of sin has been revealed yet insofar as that we know for sure who he is. We might have some ideas as to who it might be, but it's not clear yet. Now the apostasy has most certainly already started at the time of Paul. In the early first century when people who knew the truth rejected the truth, fell away from the true gospel as Paul says. He says, I marvel how quickly you have already fallen away from the truth. It has been continuing, but it always is referring to those who once understood the truth and then fell away from it. It most certainly has happened under Mr. Dekarch, after Mr. Armstrong died, who had restored the truth to the Church of God. And then comes Mr. Dekarch and Mr. Dekarch Jr. and Mike Fizel and Bernie Schnippert and Greg Albrecht and you name them all, and have engaged in an absolute apostasy, doing away with just about everything which was true. But it will continue. Because if you look at this verse, it talks about apparently approximately the, the same time setting here. So let's not be deceived by any means thinking that this is all behind us and we are safe. You should be aware of the fact that there is going to be more deceit ahead of us. And then the man of sin will also be revealed, will become very clear to those who understand the truth as to who this person is. And then he gives us even more information. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God. Apparently the Jews will again build another temple. And apparently this man of sin will actually sit in it, maybe in the holiest of holiest, showing himself or proclaiming that he is God. And no wonder people will worship him. No wonder people worship the false prophet, that man of sin, because he claims he is God. 
And so they believe it. And we also read that he is performing mighty signs and wonders, thereby deceiving the masses. He will also be in Jerusalem, as the beast will be in Jerusalem. That is why the kings from the east will not just attack Europe, but also the Middle East, because they are after the beast and the false prophets. And remember now, by that time, the armies of the beast will have conquered Jerusalem, will be stationed there. When we return to Revelation chapter 16 now, in verses 10 and 11, we have read that the Euphrates River will be dried out, so that the way for the kings of the east is being made clear and easy to them, not just with air, you know, with, with airplanes, but also apparently with tanks. So now they can cross this area easily. Now, as I said, the beast will have planted his tents in Jerusalem. Now, this doesn't mean that he will always be there. That doesn't mean that he is going to have just one headquarters. Even the very concept of planting tents talks about a temporary residence. I'm reminded of Adolf Hitler during World War II. You know, he had several places in several different areas where he would reside from time to time. Those of you who have studied World War II history, they will probably be familiar with those places. They were all called headquarters. One was called Wolfschanze in East Prussia, in Poland. If you have seen the movie with uh, Tom Cruise about the Valkyrie, where Klaus Stauffenberg tried to kill Hitler, that was at that particular place in East Prussia. Then you had a place called Werwolf in the Ukraine. You had a place called Felsen Nest in Germany, Münster Eifel. Then you had the Eagle's Nest in Austria, over Salzburg. And of course, then you had the Führer Bunker in Berlin, that's where he committed suicide. With his wife, Eva Braun, when they got married there first. All of these were headquarters. All of these were places where Hitler resided from time to time. So, when we have read earlier that darkness will befall the throne of the beast, that's not talking about Jerusalem, you see, because you still will have the headquarters in Europe. But you also will be living from time to time in Jerusalem, will plant his tent there. So let's not get these things confused. So what the kings of the east apparently will do, when they will attack again, they will attack both Europe and the Middle East, apparently sweeping through Europe, but by that time the beast won't be, long, won't be any longer there. And the false prophet, they will be then in Jerusalem. But you see, we have explained that in prior Q and A's as well, that it's actually the Medes, the modern Ukrainians, the modern Russians, which will attack and destroy Europe, including the city of Rome. So putting this all together, that's how it has to be. The kings of the East will attack or move towards the Middle East, but they will at the same time, some of their armies, attack Europe and destroy Rome and other cities. But let's go back to what is talked about Armageddon. Because as I said, there's not going to be a place where a battle takes place. What we read is that the kings of the East, and apparently all the other kings as well, will be moved demonically to get to that place. Apparently, with the motive, with the goal, to wipe out the beast power and that religious leader over there in Jerusalem. But then things will change. Because remember now, the demons coming out of the beast and the false prophet, they will have an impact here. Now we don't know exactly why they change. We don't know exactly how this is coming about. But they will combine their forces, all of them, and then move to Jerusalem, not any longer to fight the beast or the false prophet, but to fight another enemy. And that enemy, in their minds, is none other than the returning Jesus Christ. Now, 
there are different possibilities as to why they will all turn against Jesus Christ. And of course, you know, you have enemies, and then if two enemies see a common enemy, they easily become friends to fight that common enemy, and that's what's going to happen. And they all will move towards Jerusalem, and the great battle is not going to be fought at Armageddon. See, Armageddon, that just means hill of Megiddo. And it's about 55 miles north of Jerusalem, or 15 miles inland from the Mediterranean Sea. Megiddo is a huge mount with a commanding view, we are told, of the long and fertile valley of Jezreel, or Jezreel, as some say, an ideal place for armies gathering there. But then they will move towards Jerusalem to fight the returning Jesus Christ. We never read about a battle of Armageddon. But we read about a battle of God Almighty, and that will be fought in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, which is called today the Kidron Valley, bordering Jerusalem on the east. But before that battle unfolds, some other important things will have to take place. And remember, we are all here in the confines of the seventh trumpet, and we have now reached the last plague of the seventh trumpet. But before I go into that, I want to give a few ideas as to why they all will combine their forces to fight Jesus Christ. Now, there are several possibilities. I talked about this before. There is one possibility. It's an old, ancient legend in the Catholic Church, old prophecy, that when Jesus Christ returns, people will be so deceived that they believe that he is the Antichrist. He is somebody who is coming back, and I believe the two witnesses probably will have proclaimed all of that already, so people are prepared for it, that here this very powerful being is coming back, and he is going to do away with Sunday, he is going to reinstate the Sabbath, he is going to reinstate the Ten Commandments, he is going to tell the people, oh, there is no Trinity, and on and on it goes. And people will be so deceived that they think, oh, there's got to be Antichrist, because we know, don't we? that we follow the false prophet, he is God, he has already told us who and what God is like. So that's one possibility, that they actually all fight against Christ because they think he is the Antichrist, but it's not a complete and total explanation because we are dealing with people from the East, kings from the East, who may or may not even have anything to do with Christian belief systems. So another possibility might very well be that they look at this power as a foreign alien force. Now before you dismiss that and think, oh well, you know, that's too far-fetched, I picked up this magazine in Germany, very respective and respected magazine, it's actually the May 2012 edition. It's in German. It's talking about the threat out of space for God. And I was surprised to learn, if you can look at this picture, I don't know whether you can see it, here's the alien landing in Rome. And here's the Pope looking at it. So this article points out that the Vatican is highly involved in figuring out what they are going to do when, not if, when, aliens land on this earth. And this article shows that, for instance, high-ranking Vatican officials have been, for years, been looking into the space, into the sky, to make sure that they know when all of this happens. I'm trying to get to the article here, it's on page 34, it tells me here. Uh, just to give you a few summary quotes, here's another interesting article, uh, interesting picture. Again, the alien spacecraft landing in Rome. And first I thought, well, that couldn't be possibly true, and then we find out that the Jesuits and other Vatican astronomers are all prepared for the event. Preparing for the event. And then they are talking about, yeah, but what's going to happen? And then there are some speculations. Some say, well, you know, maybe they are, these aliens are friendly. And, and maybe we can convict them to Christianity. Others say, well, you know, maybe Christ was already on these other planets in the form of an alien and kind of died for them as well. And so there are all kinds of different concepts. But the one which is very interesting, most Protestants and Catholics, well, I should say not most, every third Catholic or Protestant 
believes that the aliens would be a danger for their religion and more feel even for other religions. And the question is being asked here, will the arrival of the aliens lead to another crusade, another war between mankind and those because of their different faith? Now I thought in light of what the Bible is telling us that all these nations will combine their forces to fight the returning Christ and they all will be demonically inspired. Who knows whether something like that could have a bearing on it. We don't know exactly why they will, but we know that they will all get together fighting against Jesus Christ. Now this brings us to the seventh of the last seven plagues. And notice in Revelation chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. Now remember, there were seven plagues. That's the last plague now. There can't be any other after that. So the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and great hail from heaven upon men, every hailstone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. You see, when the seventh angel sounds, these things will happen. And you can look at Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 13, for instance, which seems to be talking about that same great earthquake. I like to go to Isaiah chapter 24, though, to show you the magnitude of that earthquake. I mean, it says there has never been an earthquake that big. It talks about every island will flee away. I mean, we are not talking about a very modest earthquake here. Isaiah 24. In verse 19, Isaiah 24 and verse 19, it says, The earth is violently broken, the earth is split open, the earth is shaken exceedingly, the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall totter like a hut, its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. Not that kind of earth filled with wickedness, that will not rise again. So it seems to be talking about that time when this earthquake will strike. But something else will happen at that time, when the seventh trumpet blows. And there can only be one seventh trumpet. The last trumpet, at the time of the last plague. What will happen? Jesus Christ will return, and the saints, converted Christians, will be resurrected to immortality. Or, if they are still alive, they will be changed to immortality. Now we know the scriptures. We have read them many, many times. We shouldn't be confused about the fact that that is the time of Christ's return. The only time of Christ's return. But let's read it again just to make sure we understand and let's not get deceived by those who tell you something different. I consider this extremely important because it all goes back to the concept of the secret rapture. This has been going on for a long, long time. That Christ will come back somehow, either secretly or even openly. And he will take the saints to heaven. And then the saints will be in heaven for I don't know how long. And then he will come back again, openly. Right? This is a concept of the secret rapture, which is demonic in origin. I've talked about this many times. I've written about it many times. This concept, Christ is coming back, even if it's just for a few days to take the saints to heaven and then comes back with the saints. It's just a variation of that same wrong concept because Christ doesn't come back twice. He comes back once. And notice what happens when he comes back at the last trumpet, at the time of the last plague. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 50 to 56. 
Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed at the last trumpet. Notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning at verse 15. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, it's talking about his coming, will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, that same last trumpet we've read about. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, to welcome him, not going back with him to heaven, because the Bible makes very clear we are not going to go to heaven, but rather we are going to rule on the earth, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So what's going to happen? So we are meeting him, the one who is returning from heaven. We are meeting him in the clouds, the atmosphere. That's not the third heaven. There are no clouds in the third heaven. So we are meeting him on, in the clouds. So what's going to be the next step? Well, the next step is clearly revealed to us in Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. Beginning in verse 3. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations, those nations who are now moving towards Jerusalem from Armageddon, as he fights in the day of battle, verse 4, and in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two, how? Through that earthquake we have just read about, that huge earthquake from the west to the east, or the east to the west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move towards the north, and half of it towards the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Asal. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. But this is now the strong earthquake we read. This other one was just a forerunner. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. And if there's any doubt as to when that's going to happen, it shall come to pass in that day that there will be no light. The lights will diminish. It shall be, in, it shall be one day, one twenty for our day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time it shall happen that it will be light. It's the same day. When Jesus Christ returns, when we meet him in the air, we all will descend to the Mount of Olives. It shall split in two, making a very large valley where the final battle of God Almighty will take place in that Kidron Valley we read about. Christ will come and he will conquer the armies that will try to fight him, as well as the modern leaders of modern Babylon, the beast and the false prophets. Notice this in Revelation chapter 19. You see, think about the scenario that Christ is coming back. Here are the armies moving towards Jerusalem. So Christ is taking us. We go back to heaven and here are the armies moving towards Jerusalem. Think about that. Does this make any logical sense? Revelation 19, verses 19 to 21. Then I saw the beasts the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone and the rest were killed with a sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the words were filled with their flesh. Let's talk about this destruction of these armies which we have just read about here in Revelation. Let's go back to Zechariah chapter 14. We are still talking about the last trumpet and the last plague. Here this last plague is more clearly 
described, Zechariah chapter 14. And verse 12. Zechariah 14 and verse 12. And this shall be the plague, that last plague we are talking about, with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. The flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet, their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, their tongues shall dissolve in their mouth. It shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. Every one will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand, and so on. It will be a supernatural, quick end of that war. The beast, the false prophet, will be cast into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And we also read in other places, like in Revelation 14, just referring to it right now, that this battle, which is going to take place in the valley of Jehoshaphat or the Kidron Valley, will be the battle where the great wine press of the wrath of God was trampled outside the city of Jerusalem. It says in Revelation 14, verses 19 to 20, that blood came out of the wine press up to the horses' bridles for 1,600 furlongs, which is about 140, 184 miles. That's how many people will die in that last quote unquote battle. But we also read that 10 European kings or kingdoms had given their authority to the beast. Now that's something which we are still waiting for to see when we turn to Revelation chapter 17. We have been talking about we have been talking about the fact that the 27 member states which we have right now in Europe will probably be reduced to about 10 nations or groups of nations. We're talking about Europe of two speeds, we're talking about core Europe. We're talking about the fact that these 10 nations will have adopted and will have retained the euro, even though some may not retain the euro. It's an open question whether Greece will or not, but those 10 core nations will, because the euro is that glue which binds them together. But they then in turn will they give their power, their authority to the beast. Revelation 17, verses 12 to 13. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings, who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour, very short time, as kings with a beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. And they will also participate in the battle against Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ returns, notice verse 14. These will make war with the Lamb. Those ten nations, those ten kings. And the Lamb will overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him, who is that? That's us. Are called, chosen, and faithful. But you see, we even find that prior to that final battle, these ten kings, or kingdoms, will turn against the religious power. Now that's something we should keep in mind. So the combination between church and state over there in Europe won't be as strong as many may think. It was never that strong even in history. It will come to the point where they will turn against the political power. Notice this, Revelation chapter 17. And let's look at verse 16. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. Could be talking about the idea of confiscating the property, something which Hitler actually wanted to do after World War II. He wanted to then launch war against the Catholic and Roman, I mean Roman Catholic and Protestant churches. So this is apparently going to happen. But this is not going to affect the beast and the false prophet because you see they are going to be in Jerusalem by the time, but it will refer to the system, the religious and the political system, as well as the city of Rome. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 9 tells us that the seven heads are seven mountains or hills on which the woman sits. The woman is also identified as a city, so that city is built on seven hills. Rome is built on seven hills. 
By the way, Constantinople is too. Constantinople, which at one time, of course, was the empire or the, the leader or the capital, I should say, of the East Roman Empire. But the point is those ten nations will hate that religious system. Now, let's also notice one other scripture in 2 Thessalonians to get the time setting clear. To do away totally with the concept that Christ will come back first, that he will take us to heaven, and that he will then come back later and what have you, I mean, fight those armies and punish the wicked. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Notice what the Bible tells us what's going to happen. Beginning in verse 3. 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, since it is a righteous thing that God, uh, with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and, for seven, to give you who are troubled rest with us, when? When is he going to repay those with tribulation who trouble us? When is he going to give us rest? When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, remember when he comes back, sitting on a white horse, the armies of heaven, also sitting on white horses, are following him. It's the angelic army. Okay, now when he is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, verse 8, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in the saints and to be admired among those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. No time difference here. No distinction between him coming first to be admired by the saints and then coming later again to punish the wicked. It's not here. Nowhere in the Bible can you actually look at anything like that and try to find proof for that concept. Also notice Revelation chapter 14. Notice, we have just read here in 2 Thessalonians, it talks about, in verse 9, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord when he comes to be admired by us. Presence of the Lord. Notice Revelation 14, verses 9 and 10. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives this mark on his forehand, forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. So when Christ returns, that's what he is going to do. In conclusion, I'd like to just leave you with one thought. Now some might think that the blowing of the trumpet, the seventh trumpet, depicts just the event of the resurrection, or the change of the saints, and that of course will occur within the time span of a few seconds, because it's true, we have read that, that when Christ returns, the saints will be resurrected or changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it's the last trumpet, the seventh and last trumpet. And they all will descend on the Mount of Olives on the same day, which is a 24-hour day, and it will then be that the armies of the powers of the world will be destroyed. Now the confusion for some might come in when they think all the other events which take place when the seventh trumpet sounds, they will all take place on the same day. Now that is impossible. That's not the case. Remember, the seventh trumpet consists of seven last plagues. The seventh trumpet will blow for quite a while if you put the word blow in quotes, because it consists of the seven last plagues, which will obviously begin prior to Christ's return. 
For example, during the sixth plague, the armies of the world will move to and assemble at Armageddon. Now, that will take some time. Then they will move towards Jerusalem. That will take some time. The point is, when they have reached Jerusalem, that's the time when the last plague begins, when Christ returns, when the saints will be changed, when we are going to be on the Mount of Olives. That's when that battle takes place. Christ will only return once, not twice, or three times, or whatever. You see, the Bible says that very clearly. Christ returns. He came once to die for us. He will return a second time to give us the glory and come for our salvation. It doesn't say, and then he will come a third time to take care of the wicked people. As I said, this is a wrong concept. It's a dangerous concept. I've been in the church long enough to know how dangerous it can be. I've known ministers who are now in other church organizations, claiming to be part of the body of Christ, who have preached that Christ will come back, he will take us to heaven, we will keep the marriage supper there in heaven, he and us will come back later to this earth, to do what? I mean, I suppose to fight those armies and then go back to heaven. And then we'll be in heaven for a thousand years, ruling from heaven, whereas the Bible clearly says that we will rule on the earth, not just over the earth, on the earth and over the earth. But you see how it all starts. It all starts subtly. It all starts with a wrong concept, which is kind of bought. And that wrong concept leads to the next concept, and it leads to the next concept, and so on. This is, my friends, brethren, how the apostasy under Mr. Descartes started. It started very subtly. It started with the concept we already born again. Once we had that established, quote unquote, we, I mean they, then of course there was no need any longer that we are going to be born into the kingdom of God when Christ returns. We're already in the kingdom. And one led to the other. If you want to go back to the changes, how they were subtly introduced, read our free booklet, Are You Already Born Again? It points out in the last several pages how these changes were subtly introduced, one after the other. The same danger exists today. We have to make sure that we don't fall for any of it, lest we fall for the rest. I believe the apostasy is still ahead of us. A big apostasy. In the church of God I'm talking about, because we are the ones who know the truth. We are the only ones who can fall away from the truth. So let's be aware of that, and let's keep those timeline events in mind as to what the Bible clearly says is going to happen. And let's not fall for any speculations trying to suggest something different.